I figured I'd do a bit of a come down from that last one, though in saying that, this video is still going to be weird. That just comes with the territory when dealing with Michael Reynolds. Let's talk about Illbleed. Or rather, let's talk about Michael Reynolds' virtual horror land, Illbleed. My attachment to this game doesn't come from me having played it in the past. In fact, like with Manhunt, this will be my first time playing Illbleed. However, why I know of its existence is because of a little-known YouTuber by the name of Super Great Friend. Those in the know know that SGF is a curator of the strange and the bizarre. Coming out of these Something Awful forums, his first few LPs were done with text only, much like how forum LPs were done. His first audio LP was Illbleed, and it was the first series I've ever watched by him. For as old as it is, it will be its 12th anniversary come this October 30th, it's an LP that still holds up and acts as the basis for many of SGF's later ones. That's the pedigree we're looking at. Alright, so there's our ticket. So now let's enter Michael Reynolds' uh, hit TV show for kids. It doesn't, Michael Reynolds doesn't seem like the type of guy who would be doing kids programming, but whatever, let's go in. Now, as we enter Toy Hunter, this is the place where the game, uh, it, it starts to, starts to make not a lot of sense. November 27th, 1998, or in North America's case, September 9th, 1999. 999. That's a visual novel series that I'd probably enjoy. Granted, I need to check out more of Chunsoft's catalog, as the only series I've honestly engaged with from them is Danganronpa. I is another one that... I'm getting off topic. Sega's D-Day, the release of the Dreamcast. With the relative failure of the Saturn, I say relative because as a console it did have some fondly remembered games due to a number of factors, I did say some games because the Saturn's library was small due to its tricky hardware. The markets between Sega Japan and Sega America were wholly different and both teams had a hard time agreeing on what to do which led to some major resignations and the PlayStation was $100 less than the Saturn. Sega was thoroughly in their console downward spiral. Their last hurrah for home computer hardware development was the Dreamcast. It itself already dealt a mortal blow in the form of EA choosing not to publish games for it. That's not to say that the Dreamcast had a terrible launch. Sega had rolled out the red carpet for Sonic's first, not counting 3D Blast or Jam, foray into the third dimension. A great transition, if I do say so myself. But our history doesn't care for that game or the many other Dreamcast launch titles including Soul Calibur, Power Stone, or MK Gold. Instead, we cast our eyes to the Activision published... Shit. I guess it is Halloween. All the scary game companies are coming out of the woodwork. Here I thought this was a come down. Anyway, the Activision published and Climax Graphics developed Blue Stinger as our point of interest. Yet it is not our starting point nor is the launch of the Dreamcast. Instead, we must time warp back to in between the 80s and 90s. Around this time, Shinya Nishigaki had broken into the games industry as a promotion consultant for the Daiko Advertising Agency. A career in advertisement wasn't odd for the Nishigaki family. Shinya's father also worked in the business. However, Masao Nishigaki's background was that of film. Indeed, in a game developer blog post, John Anderson states that Masao was an advertising executive at Toho Studios and would allow his son to accompany him to movie premieres and showings. It was here that Nishigaki immersed himself in European and American films, all of which he could watch for free. A love of movies was instilled into a young Shinya, one that would blossom in due time. For four years, Shinya toiled away at Daiko, learning the ins and outs of an ever-growing industry before pulling the trigger when he was 26. He shifted his path closer to games development by jumping over to Enix. Cutting his teeth with the localizations of Dragon Quest 2 and 3 is a stopgap, as technically he was classified under business development, not games, though Moby Games does give him an assistant producer credit for Dragon Quest 3, he once again relocated himself, this time to the relatively new Climax Entertainment. All they had under their belts at the time was Shining in the Darkness. Stepping up to the plate, Shinya landed a decent first impression with Climax Entertainment, acting as the promotion director for their second game, Shining Force, and the scenario writer for their third game. 
Landstalker. I say this because by the time that Climax Entertainment was creating their next two titles, Lady Stalker and Dark Savior, Shinya had much bigger roles. Not only did he handle the scenarios for both games, he was a map designer for Lady Stalker and a map planner plus producer for Dark Savior. Yet the RPG train wasn't going to last forever. Climax Entertainment CEO Ken Nightow wanted the company to branch out, figuring that they should venture off into racing games with their next title. Runabout. Shinya didn't have the same aspirations. His aim was much higher. Taken from the man's mouth in an interview with Game of Sutra via Schmupulations, I could see that the next generation of gaming hardware was going to have incredible graphics, so in September of 1996, in order to capitalize on the know-how they accumulated at Climax, I decided to create a special strike team of designers and developers formed from the CG division that worked on Dark Savior. This became the core of Climax Graphics. The movie seed had blossomed into a cherry tree, Shinya wanting to act on his desires of making cinematic games. Thus, as Anderson provides, he left Climax Entertainment to form a sister company in the Shinjuku district of Tokyo, 15 minutes away from the offices of his former employer. Now, this wasn't poaching. There was a working agreement between entertainment and graphics. They would share any developmental breakthroughs they made between each other, strengthening both companies. So while entertainment was working on another game that would score favorably with critics and the masses, graphics and Shinya were busy discussing with Sega culminating in Project BS. What I title all my non-video projects. Though the Dreamcast hadn't been released yet, Sega wanted BS, or for its real name, Blue Stinger, on the console, leading to an awkward moment for Climax Graphics. They had no tools. As Nishigaki describes, instead we all went to local power plants and supermarkets to do old-fashioned location shoots. We put a lot of effort into the stage design, it was all we could do at that point, really, but because we spent a great deal of time on the visual quality and the variety slash richness of the stages, we had a lot of confidence going into the development. Sega wasn't the only company that Climax Graphics was talking to, they were also negotiating with some American companies in regards to getting reference material for Blue Stinger. This has its ties to Shinya's college days, specifically when he took up a part-time job in TV production for a sci-fi show. Back in 1985, I think, there was that first wave sci-fi boom in Japan with movies like The Thing. I was super into all of it. I had a part-time job on a TV production then, and I actually helped plan one of those sci-fi TV shows in Japan. A lot of special FX experts came to Japan then to help out. They were extremely friendly, and I remember them saying how they'd like to work together someday. Of course, I was just a student then, so I didn't take it very seriously, but here I was 12 years later, starting Project BS, so I called them them up. Hey, remember how we talked about working together? And to my surprise, they replied, we remember, let's do it, are Shinya's exact words. However, he wanted to keep development strictly within Japan as the Dreamcast would see the light of day there first. Thus, with a team of only 18 people, one of them future Basilisk creator Masaki Sagawa, Climax Graphics kicked off production for Blue Stinger in 97. And what a grueling two years it was. Shinya had an artistic vision for Blue Stinger, a cinematic game that could draw you into its world via its realism. Man, that phrase, cinematic game, has been poisoned more than Nero drinking from her cup. Before you get a migraine, what Shinya meant by cinematic was a seamless game without loading screens or weirdly partitioned stages and foreground slash backgrounds. In short, a truly real-time world to explore. A game with the same visual quality as a movie, where you see is what you get. For the second half of the idea, Shinya explains that even before Blue Stinger, the way I've sought to create empathy and immersion for the players through the skillful, careful placement of key locations which create the sense of a lived-in environment. I don't just mean with cutscenes and events either, I want the whole game to have that kind of presence. In doing so, I hope to create a connection or link between you, the player, with the third-person godlike perspective of events, and the in-game player character. Character. By the same token, more realistic environments and visuals means we have to think about player immersion in a new way. To take dialogue as an example, in early adventure games you could have NPCs say stuff like, thank you, I'll give you this as a reward, but that kind of unrealistic, simplistic dialogue won't work now. The main narrative of Blue Stinger would follow Elliot Belade and Dogs Bower as they solve the mystery of Dinosaur Island, home to the meteor that killed the dinosaurs, while dealing with a malignant menagerie of mutants marauding the archipelago. Some Somehow the Bermuda Triangle is also involved, as well as aliens. 
I don't know, and I watched all of SGF's live stream of it. All 15 hours, cause I'm a crazy man and like dying a bit on the inside. Can I count retroactive deaths? Well, I'm going to, as it has been too long since I've done this joke. Remember how I said that Climax Graphics team was only 18 members? Well, to pull the game off, 24-hour days were common, Anderson articulating that through the two-year development period, the staff only took five or six days off. All I can say to that is please don't crunch yourself or anyone for anything unless you're one of those odd people who like personally doing it on your own without forcing anyone else to follow you. I would say normal everyday person John Carmack, but then I'd be borrowing a joke and I'm better than that. Anyway, Climax Graphics Baby would end up being taken into the mines as Sega gave worldwide publishing rights of the game to Activision. Even before they were sucked into Blizzard, Activision wasn't afraid of making boneheaded moves, demanding that Blue Stinger's purpose-made camera system to be changed. Back in the blog post, Anderson writes that Activision wanted the camera angle closely following the character behind in every direction. This was a drastic change from Nishigaki's approach for the Japanese version, in which the camera followed character action from a distance using a wide-angle view to showcase the background design design of each environment. Climax Graphics changed the angle to what Activision would call the follow cam. This change seriously damaged the likability of Blue Stinger abroad and drew criticism from many players of its English localization. Still, Blue Stinger sold particularly well in the States, better than in Japan, leading to Sega asking for a sequel. An impossibility, as Climax Graphics was already in pre-production for a B-movie survival horror game by the name of Ill bleed. My thinking method is to have an ending approach. I wanted to do an American thriller and suspense movie title. For three months I thought about the ending boss itself and how complex it was going to be. I was thinking about this idea for a long time. I wanted it to have a logical structure and comedy. When, where, who, why, and how. This is my logical structure base. After three months, I finished the layout and basic concept of the game from the maps, the mini-movies, purpose, and trying to mix in American B-movies, Shinya posited to Anderson. Illbleed was aiming to be, like Shinya Nishigaki, unlike its contemporaries. The main threats to the player weren't monsters or guys in masks wanting to kill them, it was the level itself. Revamping Blue Stinger's engine, Kazuki Yokozawa, whose hobby of programming lifted him out of being a salary man, came up with the idea of the four senses system the player would have to use in conjunction with an item called the Horror Monitor to avoid shock events. Each stage was a humorous mock-up of a classic B-movie or ideas related to them. There was even a playful jab at Sonic with the demon hog Zodic, which probably didn't endear Climax to Sega. That was amidst all the referential nods made to Blue Stinger. Taking only a year and a half for production, as Climax had 23 employees at the time, Illbleed was ready for 2000's Tokyo Game Show, as it was already assumed that Sega would publish the title on its own outside of Japan since Blue Stinger had previously been so successful. Yet yeah, Illbleed was met with many other interested industry players at TGS, one of whom was Ken Grants of Jaleco USA. Nishigaki also had offers from five other different publishers. But there is a reason why I said Cherry Tree. First off, Sega dropped first party publishing rights for Illbleed, leaving it without a publisher until the struggling Jaleco picked it up. They had enough games for first party support, so Illbleed drew the short end of the stick. Then came the death knell for the Dreamcast. January 21st, 2001. Sega announces they are discontinuing the Dreamcast. The company had decided to cut their losses and focus on third-party software development. Having to rebound from that, Climax Graphics changed their name to Crazy Games to present the idea of being an independent developer. This would harm Illbleed by way of confusing consumers who didn't know that Climax and Crazy were the same entity. Crazy wasn't the only company going through a rebrand, however, as members of Jaleco left to form Amusement Interface Associates. Swept up in the move was Illbleed, who would now be localized under this new startup. At the end of it all, Illbleed Bleed would only sell 50,000 copies internationally, a knife to the gut if there ever was one. Oh wait, come 2002, Crazy Games would close up its doors. Many employees of the company, including Shinya, would be folded into Kavya on behest of Hiso Aguchi, president of Hitmaker who co-developed Maze of Kings with Crazy Games. 
And yet I wish I could say it got better. I've been referencing John Anderson a lot, especially his blog post on Game Developer. That's because he plays a role in this history being the one that broke the news of Shinya Nishigaki's untimely passing. John, in Nishigaki's later years, became close with the developer to the point that when he had their sit-down interview, the Game Developer blog post I've been calling back to, Shinya gave John an Erico Christie action figure and even exchanged numbers with him. It was because of this did John learn about Ground Zero as Shinya was working on a project like his Dreamcast endeavors and John wanted to see it come to fruition. He was promised that he would experience a working demo of it. Three months after their interview, John emailed Shinya to no response. He then called a few weeks later to the response of voicemail. John would try again where he would find out what happened to Shinya via Kavia's vice president. At age 42, while at home, Shinya Nishigaki suffered a fatal heart attack. News of his death didn't reach out until several months later when John wrote his obituary for GameSpot. John, in the process of doing this, was also the one to break the news to people who had worked with Shinya. The life of Shinya Nishigaki is one of deep admiration. What drove him as a developer was his love of games. As Anderson puts it, Nishigaki cared about games plain and simple, and the energy it took to make one that was entertaining. The fact that he turned down Sega for a sequel to Blue Stinger proved he didn't want to milk franchises. He went forward with his own original ideas in an industry gasping for air in a sea of sequels. In an industry that is filled to the brim with scumbags, especially now with my bringing up Take-Two in the last video plus EA and Activision here, Nishigaki stands out as someone that anyone going into the industry should aspire to be. Despite Illbleed's lack of success, it grew a cult following with even an unofficial sequel in the works. When told of that, Shinya acknowledged it with a casual, I like this energy, so it's okay with me. If I had to choose money or energy, I would choose energy. If one person likes Illbleed, then to me, it's a success. Shinya wasn't in it for the money, he was in it for the passion. Now, I don't know how much of that passion was turned as a poison against Shinya, as I can't say who demanded 24-hour days, whether it was him or Sega. I'm optimistically guessing Sega because of how publishers tend to act in the industry, but I think Shinya's death does highlight an issue for the games industry that is still going on. Crunch culture. It's proven time and time again that it doesn't need to exist, what with the likes of Hades kicking about, yet developers from all over the world still engage in it. It snuffs out people's lifespans as it does their creativity. How many bright young developers entered the industry only to wind up soul-sundered husks due to burnout? And that's not even counting the more despicable actions some companies take with their employees, such as with Activision Blizzard or Quantic Dream. I don't want to assume, but I think that people tend to care more about the developer name than the actual people on the team. Like, sure, there are your Johns or your Hideki's, but they are just one person on a team of people. They may have an important role, but they can't do it all by themselves. I guess I just want people to care more about those in the games industry that aren't headlining names, that are trying their best, not making it shitty, not perpetuating the garbage, these people need recognition too. What perplexes me is the amount of time it took for a majority of people to know that Shinya died, that his colleagues learned of his death only when John wrote his obituary speaks volumes about how the machine views its cogs. Something that Shinya expressed in the interview with John as he spoke directly about the downsides of the industry. Seeing as I've rambled my way to this point, I use the emulated Dreamcast version of Illbleed as it's the only easily accessible way to play. Our tale opens up in a speech competition. Eriko Christie, our main heroine, is discussing her life and how she has no fear, what with her father scaring it out of her when she was young. After doing I Assume Well, she reunites with her friends Kevin Kurtzman, Michelle Waters, and Randy Fairbanks to learn that the four have been invited to Illbleed. President of the Student Council, it's a given. You win this speech contest for sure. What, Michelle? Why didn't you listen to Erico's speech? I don't need to. I know she'll win. Here, take a look at this. Those are guest invitations to Illbleed. How'd you get them? From a Pepco promotion. Cool! Look, we can win a hundred million bucks there. 
Banking itself as the only theme park that kills you, Ill Bleed has taken many people, but Erico's friends want to be the first to beat it as those who complete the park get a hundred million dollars. Not up for being set for life, Erico passes as her friends rush to challenge the park. A few days pass with them still gone, forcing Erico to take on the park to rescue her friends. Excuse me, did you see three high school kids around here three days ago? They had special invites. What? <laughs> The first attraction she hits is Home Run of Death, where Gail Banbala went insane due to a combination of having lost his son in a fire and being caught in it as well, roasting him to grotesque perfection. You play a sport, a game, knowing full well that you're going to either win or lose. You never expect to die before your dreams come true. Neither did Jimmy, or his father, Gail Banbalo, a Minnesota innkeeper. He set up a secret baseball practice arena in the basement of his inn, where he and his son practiced day after day. Jimmy's hard work and batting skills finally led his team to a state victory. It started out a crisp spring day, but before Jimmy could go outside to play, he and his dad went downstairs to bat the ball around a few times. Upstairs, some teenagers had been playing with fire, turning the inn into a raging blaze that was soon out of control. The inn was a total loss, and so was Jimmy, burned in minutes. Mr. Banbala was so badly maimed, he turned into a hideous monster, oozing and bleeding, snarling and growling like a beast, enraged and bent on revenge. He tracked down the kids responsible for the fire and killed them one by one with a blowtorch. That wasn't enough for Bambalo. He won't leave his inn or his memories, so there he waits, in ambush. He stalks his chateau, offing any team brave or stupid enough to explore it, but Erico easily trounces the attraction and rescues Kevin. Next, the duo tackle Revenge of Queen Worm, where a worm farmer, David, got tricked out of his land before hanging himself due to lowering worm prices. Turns out people don't like eating worm burgers, but I bet I didn't have to tell you that one. An RV campsite has been turned into a morbid morgue, covered in blood, and the remains of numerous unidentified bodies. It's hard to believe that such a brutal massacre could have happened in this day and age, especially at such a secure location. It only took the rescue crew 20 minutes to respond to the emergency call, but by the time they arrived, it was too late. There were no survivors, and consequently no witnesses. So the mystery remains. Who or what could have done this? It seems too massive and malicious for a single human to have done it, or several for that matter. There were dark forces at work here, and no one's talking about it. It happened four days ago, and the place has been dead quiet ever since.
However, David's ghost won't be laid to rest until Rachel, the Queen Worm, is dead, though Erico and Kevin easily flambe her before retrieving Michelle. The Now trio move on to wood puppets and saving Randy. In the movie, George McLaughlin, sawmill owner and proven lonely soul, made the greatest chainsaw the world ever saw, but the tree he wanted to cut down to show how great his saw was instead ate the woodsman. With new workers taking over the plant, everything was good until they disappeared and mysterious wood puppets got sent to the families of the workers. George McLaughlin knew there was more to life than running a sawmill. He loved what he did, but he needed better equipment. He'd make the finest, fastest chainsaw man has ever seen. That chainsaw instantly would tear through wood with a nice clean cut and would make him the envy of anyone in the lumber business. He knew just the tree to cut to prove the merits of his product. It was 800 years old, huge, gnarly, and tough as nails. He took a picture of himself in front of the tree and then started to saw. Suddenly a face appeared on the tree and it swallowed him. He was presumed lost in the wilderness or eaten by a bear. No one cared because he was a loner anyway. New workers took over the mill and everything went smoothly until seven years later, when a hundred workers mysteriously disappeared. The relatives of the missing workers soon began receiving wooden boxes. The moment they opened them, a maniacal wooden doll jumped out and chased the terrified families. They used pans, sticks, or hammers to smash the dolls as best they could. Ironically, those wooden dolls spewed blood, and this freaked the people out even more. They called them wood puppets, and hoped they had seen the last of them. Tree, now of the spirit of George, is crafting these sick constructs, but the three beat him back and restore Randy, either with or without his brain. The quartet face off next with Donald Cashman in his killer department store. Being a man obsessed with money and was running out of it, Cashman duped people into buying whole heaps of products from his store with the promise of cash back. Instead, he just murdered them before he was gunned down by the police. Yet his soul has found its way back to the department store where he's spinning tricks once again. There was a big blowout sale going on at the Cashman department store, which needed something to bail it out of heavy debt. What seemed like a sale was actually a deadly disguise for a mass murder by store manager Donald Cashman, who freaked out after a run of bad business. He killed all of the customers and stole their money and valuables in his warped mind. In his warped mind, he figured they owed it to him since he couldn't make enough money in sales. When the police arrived and figured things out, they shot Cashman on sight. That should have ended the terror, but it didn't. The sheer power of Cashman's hatred and his ruthless obsession with money brought him back to life as a horrible monster. He's still making products, but this time he breathes evil into them, turning the products into monsters themselves who suck up a customer's money and soul. Cashman's out there somewhere, waiting for the next customer as he secretly sits in a safe, counting his money. That doesn't mean anything to the fore, however. Next on the list is Killer Man, which is not an attraction as it becomes an IRL mystery where the spirits of dead contestants have taken over the suit of the eponymous character to get revenge. It took place in New York in 1935. America was just coming out of the Great Depression when something happened which shocked the world. The papers called it the Killer Man Serial Murders, which began with the killing of the CEO of Manhattan Mutual Bank. The citizens of New York started to panic as there seemed to be no pattern or motivation for what would turn into 39 murders in less than a month. Since no one knew the killer's identity, people started calling him Killer Man because he always left the same trademark on his victims, a bright red star or killer mark.
Then there was nothing, no more murders, at least ones that could be traced to Killer Man, until 66 years later. He was back. He had to be. His mark was found on the face of a utility repair man near Central Park. The Manhattan Police Department immediately launched a special task force to investigate the case and hopefully prevent such a thing from happening again. Oh yeah, the four become five with reporter Jorg S. Baker joining the team. Before the group can face off with Michael Reynolds, they have to pass through Toy Hunter Cork Goes to Hell, a macabre parody of Toy Story featuring the main character trying to get into toy hell as he is the Orpheus to Sexy Dolls Eurydice. It should have been the one about the apocalyptic Cactus Man of Mexico. The popular series Toy Hunter is now a fun attraction. It's based on the new episode, Cork Goes to Hell, that's not yet released. In other words, in this attraction you'll be able to find out what happens in the new episode of Toy Hunter before anyone else. In the last episode, our hero, Cork the Toy Hunter, had defeated the Cactus Man of Mexico, and no one had seen him since. The story begins where Cork returns home for the first time in three years after a long journey. His home is a toy box full of fun things. There, Cork is reunited with his fellow toys. He thought he could go back to living peacefully as his owner Henry's favorite doll. But that was not to be. Something unbelievable happens to Henry. As a result, strange things happen around Cork. Cork's new adventure is about to begin. This attraction is a storytelling attraction that accurately reproduces this new story, Cork Goes to Hell. Here you'll assume the role of Cork and make your way to the end while fighting against horrible enemies. This attraction is not something that you merely sit and watch. The characters that appear and the settings in this story are all real. So if the enemies get you, you will die. So come and enjoy Toy Hunter, as if your life depended on it. Completed with all the attractions, the group easily beat down the last turtle in their path, a final monster of their choosing, before celebrating with their award money. However, Erica goes back as she feels she needs to do something alone at the park. Indeed, she runs right through it again, this time not saving her friends and getting scraped up to the point that she is in tatters to directly confront Michael Reynolds her father. He made the park with the purpose of getting Erico to run through it so she could regain her fear, which she wanted to do. Dad! Uh. Erico? So it was you, Dad. I knew it. You're the only guy who could have come up with such a sick and twisted place. What are you trying to do here? Ooh, I was waiting for you, Erico. You passed the test. You made it all the way through. Oh, come on, Dad. I passed your fear factor test when I was a kid. Nothing scares me or is a thrill anymore, from roller coasters to tales of the macabre. You took away my fun. And now you try and pull this stunt? How dare you? You're a maniac. Out of your mind. Aha! Music to my ears. I consider that a compliment, you know. I experience life at its fullest when someone is scared out of their wits. When someone yells out in agony. 
when they lose all hope and forget about themselves for that moment. That's the biggest adrenaline rush of all. And I feel it too, along with them. Ill bleed brings a great heightening of the senses to everyone, and especially to me. You were always such a clever girl, my dear. So it's no surprise that you finally saw through my ruse, my excuse to see you. See me for what? To shock you at last. You can't imagine what it did to my ego when nothing I did or put you through could scare you. It was as though I was a failure at my ultimate goal. It's all I've been able to think about for the past ten years. I even committed crimes to support this creation. I had to make ill bleed. To shock you, to scare you, to terrify you. Once and for all. You're a lunatic. And what's your excuse? Why did you come here if you knew I was here? I want my sense of fear back. You stole that from me. Sense of fear, eh? There's only one person I know who'd be capable of shocking me back into a normal human being. One that has a natural fear of the unknown, a dread of danger, and who can feel the thrill of panic and surprise. Hmm, let's see now. Aha! Yes, you are just in time. I was hoping you'd be joining me, so I prepared a little gift, you know, to celebrate our reunion. After all, twelve years is a long time, and you deserve a little pressy. Present? I prepared three special shock events in my VIP room. My own masterpieces shall we say. Very special indeed. Special? Yes, special. You'll see. First, turn on your horror monitor and then activate cautious action. But if you lose even one event, your pulse rate will race past a hundred. I put everything I had into this. So we're talking extreme power at its wicked worst. The event will put you into a shock mode. And what's more, you could die. Eriko, this is the chance you've been waiting for. I want you to get shocked, scared, terrified. Facing down her father, Eriko overcomes and kills her dad, but our story ends with Eriko regaining the emotion of fear to a frightening degree. Oh, and sequel bait, but that never happened. This is another game where the story recap and analysis take a backseat. All I can say to you is, do you love B-movies? If the answer to that is yes, you'll enjoy Illbleed's renditions of horror stories. Each movie has its own identity, and they don't pull any punches with their abject absurdity. What other game can you play through a level with? A disfigured youth hostel owner turned serial blowtorch killer, a titanic worm that led her owner to become the king of worms, an evil tree that doesn't work, a killer department store, a Killer Man, and the next sequel to Toy Story. If anything, you could look at Eriko regaining the emotion of fear at the end as a wraparound based on fictional versus real horror. As a kid, of course, you'd be afraid of scary or even B-movies. Then, as an adult, that potentially lessens as you know it isn't real. But when faced with true oblivion, everyone experiences fear. Fear is an emotional response that is needed, so both losing or succumbing to it in extreme instances is dangerous. I don't want this to come across as an odd observation, but this game has definite Dreamcast feel. There's something about the roundedness that the character models have that attracts me to Dreamcast graphics compared to the PlayStation or even Nintendo 64. This is the same feeling that I get when looking at Sonic Adventure Shinmu. I will say that parts of Illbleed's character models haven't aged that particularly well, mostly because the faces are just grafted onto the heads of the models. This may have been a reaction to Blue Stinger though, as the game's lip syncing for the dub was poor, so this was a lose-lose either way. Still, it does look off when characters are talking, but their faces don't emote. Everyone is a fan of gesticulation though, which I think does cover the face issue because of the tone that the game is going for. This is a B-movie turned video game, so having characters do these wacky motions with their hands fits. 
ho, ho, going to cut the tree, going to cut the tree. And I got to cut the tree, because I love to cut the tree. Yo, ho, ho, and I'm out of control. I'm going to cut the tree. <laughs> In fact, I can say that the framing of the game does help to cover up a lot of the weak spots in the game, though I don't know if that means some parts are intentional or not. I'll get to that when I go over the dub and localization, however, as I'm still on graphics. What can absolutely be applauded, however, is the art direction when it comes to making each level feel distinct. No two attractions in Ill Bleed feel like the other, and that lies within how strongly they get across their identities. Though for each level you do most of the same, going through a hallway in Home Run versus killer department store feels wholly different. From home run, you get the sense that the chateau has long since been abandoned as if it was stuck in time. All that remains is the charred aftermath of the fire that killed Jimmy staining the main front of the hostel. However, as you go deeper, you see the somewhat clean-kept bedroom belonging to Gale and the practice field that, minus some bloody writing, probably still looks as it did during its heyday. It gets across that Banbalo is so hyper-focused on Jimmy that anything that has a slight connection to the boy is sacred to the burned man, like how the opening crawl said. Likewise, going through the rented-out rooms, you get the sense that the teenagers weren't exactly the clean-cut types. Not only is there graffiti in some of the rooms, one has a table covered in beer bottles and alcohol glasses. The fireworks that caused the fire were undoubtedly the results of someone listening to Mr. Booze's terrible idea. Ideas. If you want to get full metatextual, Home Run of Death is a spoof of the slasher genre. Mr. Bonbala's victims are teenagers because the death of his son was caused by some misbehaving ones. If you leave out the sex part in bullying, Bonbalo is a direct reference to a horror icon. That is to say that Bonbalo is an analog to Mrs. Voorhees. Contrast that with Killer Department Store. While the store has seen better days, I get the assumption that it is still being well stocked. Yeah, the walls are falling apart and the produce has turned to muck, but Cashman wants people to enter. He needs their money to continue his sad existence, so he does the bare minimum of keeping the shelves stocked with products despite the deterioration of the first floor. By his own twistedness, he doesn't see what is wrong with the big picture. That gets compounded when you go to the higher floors as the toy section is spotless, almost like it's to disarm a person's suspicions, yet they would have had to go through the first floor's haphazardness to get to this part. It reinforces how incompetent Cashman is when it comes to his own plans. This is a guy who thought that having a big blowout sale as cover for a mass killing would be a great idea. Going with the meta part, while this is a stretch, I get that killer department store is a nod to Chopping Mall. I do say stretch, however, as all that really connects the two is the setting and the idea that it's about something gone wrong. For Chopping Mall, it's the mall security. For KDS, Yes, it's the products. Though there are a lot of horror movies that take place in malls, so Ill Bleed might just be going for a location parody instead of an exact one. Before I get onto the dub and whip right through the sound effects as they are okay, the only one that stands out being the scare chord, I want to go over the music because damn, Yokonori Kikuchi outdid himself. <laughs> Illbleed's soundtrack goes for an atmospheric sound, but it does so in a variety of ways. You could be serenaded by a track of traditional instruments in one level, then be hit with electronic in the next. Take Empty Hallway, one of the themes in Wood Puppets. With its slow methodical beats scored by random intrusions of off-kilter instruments before giving way to heavy synth drones, you cannot tell me that it wasn't inspired by John Carpenter's The Thing. The track captures the feeling of tension, especially since Wood Puppets is one of the more trap-populated levels. Then you have the park's main theme, which is a darkly jaunty tune that I sometimes catch myself humming. Mm -hmm. 
But this is where I have the hard time deducing what was intentional or not, as the game's dub and localization are ropey to say the least. There are a number of instances where written dialogue comes across as nonsensical. The main one I think about is from Home Run of Death's first newspaper clipping. The line, the hostel, an excellent leisure facility surrounded by nature as an excellent leisure facility is more than half-baked. What does that even mean? That the hostel is excellent because it's surrounded by nature, or that the hostel is excellent and so is the nature surrounding it? That's probably an error, but because of what the game is going for, I'm confused. This is amidst other written dialogues, such as seen in Queen Worm, where David writes that he'll go ahead and wait for Rachel around the second corner of hell, which I can only take as satire. And the spoken word is just as cloudy. There is an actual error in the game as they left in a failed take for the opening to Killer Department store and apparently the name Duranto is pronounced like Durant slash Durant, but some of the lines come across as so ridiculous that they must be in jest. Lonnie Manila was the voice director for this game, and I do think she gets the idea that Illbleed is aiming for, but that just adds to my confusion. My enjoyment of the game's weirdness isn't reliant on me figuring out this conundrum, as this is a major part of the charm for Illbleed, but dictating what is general translation errors of this era and what was meant to be is difficult. I think the voice cast does alright, especially Sonic alums Lonnie and Ryan Drummond, though hats off to Steve Brody as Michael Reynolds. Guy can do a hell of a narration. Illbleed is a survival horror game with a twist. In a traditional game of this genre, most of what is trying to kill you is either gross abominations or bad men, but here in Illbleed, Michael Reynolds has made each movie that you will have to play through the main nemesis. While there are ghoulies to deal with, usually a few per stage plus the level's boss, most of the damage you will be taking will be from the various traps littered around. All these traps are invisible to the naked eye, but that doesn't mean you can't detect them. On the main HUD is the senses bar, listing out four of the Six, sight, smell, hearing, and sixth. Whenever you are close to a trap, the wave going across the meter will pulse to varying degrees depending on how close you are to the trap. If it's a weak little pulse, you are just on the tip of the trap's range, but if it's going nuts, you are right on top of the trap and will activate it if you walk another step forward. Now, traps can be avoided the old-fashioned way by skirting around their radius, but moments to do this are few and far between. Ill bleed will railroad you into traps. That's why the horror monitor exists. With the horror monitor, which is always found near the start of a level and is picked up by all senses, you can tag traps to deactivate them. However, there is a bit of deduction when it comes to disarming traps. While the horror monitor will lock onto objects in the environment that can be traps, that doesn't mean that they are. It's up to you to figure out where a trap is placed based on your distance to it and your senses. Those senses aren't cosmetic. They give you an idea on what kind of trap will attack you. To give an example, most blade traps like sword spikes or saws are sight traps. You can physically see the object that will attack you. Meanwhile, fire traps are usually smell traps as you would smell the fragrance of burning. Lastly, phones or bells would be hearing traps as they assault your hearing. By understanding this dichotomy, can you easily avoid traps? However, this leaves out the sixth sense. Sixth sense does a twofold duty. Not only does it detect items for you to pick up, ranging from healing items to key items and even utilities, the sixth sense alerts you to enemy encounters. Unlike with other traps, it does take a bit of getting used to when determining what is an item versus what is an encounter, as items lay about the stages much like traps. One element you will have to balance out when disarming traps and picking out fights is your adrenaline. Just looking through the viewfinder of the horror monitor drains a little bit of it, but tagging takes a lot more. With no adrenaline, you can't tag traps, but you get a bit back for correctly disarming one or beating enemies. If you fail to spot a trap, a little cutscene will play out of the trap attacking you before you see what kind of damage it does. These are surprisingly varied and are the selling point of ill bleed. Trap damage comes in a few varieties. Stamina, Pulse, and Money, though most traps will hit you for a combination of Pulse and Stamina. When a trap hits you for Stamina, it takes your health depending on the severity of the trap. Having an object fall on your head hurts less than getting shocked. 
Taking any amount of stamina damage also inflicts bleed, but I'll cover that in the encounters. Running out of health is death, but that isn't the only way you can die. Pulse damage raises your heart rate. While at first that might not seem so bad, the higher it is, the more likely you will faint. Fainting occurs once your pulse is above 200, and when it happens, you fall to the ground unable to act unless you wait out the clock or if in an encounter an enemy hits you. Getting the pulse above 250, though, leads to shock death. Likewise, you can bleed out, which lowers your pulse with you flatlining at zero. Dying when you don't have additional characters is a game over unless you have the scapegoat Mary. If you do have other characters, you can switch over to them and continue the attraction, but you will need to revive the dead character at the E. Are. Money traps, meanwhile, take your money. That's it, really, and they only are a problem in one level whose gimmick are these traps. Failing to tag an encounter has negative repercussions as well, as the enemy slash enemies will spook your character, raising their pulse, but what happens afterwards is determined by who you're playing as. When Eriko gets jumped, she falls to the floor before getting right back up. Everyone else, meanwhile, crawls around for a bit defenseless, increasing their pulse rate until they get back up up, letting the monsters get in a few free swings. There is an item called the Anti-Shock Brace that mitigates the crawling around, but not only do you have to find it, its appearance is rare at times. There is also another issue, but I'll get back to that. Fighting in Hillbleed is… something. While the characters do get access to a plethora of melee and ranged weaponry, you have to find them first. Thus, getting into a scuffle without a weapon means you can't do diddly except run away, though in saying this, that is usually the best option. There are some fights that are mandatory, but not all encounters are. Sure, you can wrestle around with the meat man, but if you have max adrenaline, what is the point? Taking on monsters should only be your priority if you need adrenaline. While in combat, though, there are two separate buttons for attacking, each tied to a weapon type, a button for dodging, which gives you an enormous amount of iframes but raises your pulse by two, and you can also jump. Jumping around like you're auditioning for House of Pain will end you up in one during combat, but there are instances of platforming within the game. You cannot open the normal pause menu when in an encounter, like Kingdom Hearts, so before getting into one, make sure you're in fighting condition. This wraps me back around to bleeding. Enemies always deal stamina damage, thus getting hit by one makes you bleed. Bleeding has no effect at low levels, but once it gets high enough, merely running around will cause you to bleed more. At extreme instances of bleeding, your health and pulse starts ticking down. While there are items to lower pulse and bleeding as well as raise stamina, you can also wait for your bleeding and pulse to go down naturally. For bleeding, merely standing still or walking will lower it, though in the case of running or dodging, if it is low enough to not increase it will keep its level. I also think that if your bleeding maxes out you die, but don't quote me on that. Pulse meanwhile goes down one point per… minute? 30 seconds? A time I could never guess at? Yeah, that's the one. Outside of not wanting to die, there is another reason for why you want to balance out your health stats and disarming traps. Each level is scored based on time cleared, traps disarm, and your health stats. Beating the par earns you the movie's full prize money, with going off of it scoring you deductions. Outside of par time, it is easy to fulfill the conditions. That's because going into any of the menus, whether main or map, dealing with enemies, and I think also watching cutscenes, eat into your time. Do you skip items to earn big bucks or take an admittedly small penalty to find them? Amongst the regular gaff are upgrade items that make characters hardier. These are what you want to find as an upgraded character has a better chance of survival. From the get-go, you only have access to Eriko Christie, but in the first three stages of the game and Killer Man are her friends that can be rescued. That is, if you're quick enough. The time ranking also acts as a limit, as once you go over it in a level that has a friend, they will be considered dead. Each of Eriko's friends, and Yorg, have very stats focusing on balance or specialization. It is up to you to pick whomever you want to tackle a level with, but keep in mind that Eriko has special importance to the plot, thus enhancing her should be first priority. Upgrading isn't free, however. You need money to pay the medic dummies at the ER, so you do have to be mindful that you find said enhancement items in a timely manner. They can also heal you for a fee as they are sometimes found in levels. Of course, if you do fail to save a friend, they can be revived for a cost as well at the bank. Earned money can also be spent at the pharmacy for healing items, though items don't carry over once you complete a stage, even if you bought them. They are exactly like insurance. Stages in Illbleed are linear affairs, but that doesn't mean that they are small. They are quite big, in fact, having numerous set pieces that you will have to play through. One of the more striking elements of Illbleed is its camera system, as there are four in total separated into two categories, auto and semi. 
Never pick semi and alternate between both autos depending on whether you are platforming or not. A stage in Ill Bleed always ends with a boss fight, but these can be non-standard encounters as some you don't even fight the boss at all. A key feature to bring about the levels is that once you complete one, you can't replay it until you go on to New Game Plus, and even then it's basically a standard playthrough though you keep character upgrades. There are three endings to get in Ill Bleed, one for not saving all or only some of Erika's friends, one for saving all of them in Yorg, and the true ending which can only be unlocked after the first playthrough which requires requires you to not rescue anyone. I freaking adore the concept of this game. It simultaneously lands both the wacky, off-the-cuff B-movie vibe while generally being a thrilling gameplay experience. If you don't know by now, I love the horror genre and much of what it entails. Yes, including B-movies because of how schlocky they can get. There's nothing like turning on from hell it came to see the tree monster ham it up while everyone else is trying to give a serious performance against it. Every level has that kind of energy. And what I think is perfect about it is that Ill Bleed lulls you in. Home Run of Death is the best starting point because from its opening crawl you get the sense of, okay, this is going to be a bit serious. Don't all B-movies have the pretense of being a serious film? Then wham, it hits you with the talking baseball bat taking everything off the rails. In comes in the cannibal angle and the ridiculousness that is Banbalo and his sputtering nonsense. It's capstone by him growing to ginormous size and you having to kill his operator to complete the level. Banbalo control room. Can you hear me? This is control operator Jackson. I repeat, this is control operator Jackson in the control room. Our oil pressure is normal here. Average electric current is 52,000 volts. Generating capacity of 2,700,000 watts. 10 4, main control room here. Checking the database now. Hold on a second. The pressure on the leg is a bit too high. I bet it's the right leg. Last time I checked, it was a bit rusty. That's all right. It's still within control parameters. And what are you planning to do for dinner tonight? I'm starving. I think I'll have fish or something. At this point, meat doesn't sound too appetizing. <laughs> yeah, we got enough meat laying around over here to feed an army of rats. Help! Stop right there. This area is restricted to authorized personnel only. Please, I can't buy that horrid beast myself. I know. Isn't that cool? We spent five million dollars to build this enormous thing we call Banball. It's super alloy skeletons controlled with advanced hydraulics with custom bearings and joints. You're looking at two meters of thick titanium for every bone. All computer controlled by me. <laughs> How'd you like that big sucker, eh? From there, Illbly doesn't let up with the insanity. Revenge of Queen Worm has the baffling plot of worm burgers going out of style leading to a farmer shoving off his mortal coil. Yet he is still tied to this world as he needs someone to kill the worm that got him into the business, a gargantuan mutated worm that the farmer refers to as a daughter and writes in his memo that he will wait on the second floor of hell for her to arrive. Queen Worm might have my favorite line of the game, which has a ton of fantastic lines, where David cheerily tells Rachel, Let's go back to hell. Grandpa! Rachel! I've missed you all so. You appear to be okay. Oh, that's a relief. 
At last, we can be together forever. Let's go back to hell. Hey, you, young one. Thank you. I'll never forget your kindness. Wood Puppet starts with the gruesome death of George McLaughlin, but no one cared. He was a loner anyway. Though you do have to cut the tree, cause you love to cut the tree. Yo ho ho, and I'm out of control, and so is brainless Randy guiding you with his shrieks before beaten up by fake crash test medics. The tree at the end not working adds to the in-game unintentional IRL intentional hilarity as right when you kill it, the tree starts going on about its backstory before being cut off. Then there's Killer Department Store, what with being the greatest in all of Nebraska, the cake from hell, and having to take control of the boss to kill it. Uh, I am the cake from hell, <laughs> but I need something more to be a complete cake, a cake I'd be proud to be. I feel like the top of my head needs something glorious, or should I say, glorious to crown me. What do you have that I could wear as a decoration, hmm? I would argue that it's around KDS that the game goes full batshit B-movie, what with the store having products that literally steal your money and the store manager offing himself so that he can join Cashman in the other life to continue being a manager, but I'd be leaving out Killer Man and Toy Hunter. Toy Hunter is an R-rated Toy Story where you play as knockoff Woody and try to kill yourself so that you can reunite with that dump truck ass before the original Sonic.exe cucks you, but that is only the tip. The sole reason why Cork receives the death penalty is because of egg murder, which, judging by the world of Toy Hunter, is worse than any other crime. If those damn eggs start serenading you, you have to take it as I would hate to guess what egg assault would land you. The defendant, Quark, according to the Toy Penal Code 99, you are sentenced to death. You'll be hot at six o'clock and go directly to hell. No way! For Cork to even get to toy hell so he can be with Sexy Doll, he has to bump up his crimes up to child murder, which is completely downplayed. The star of the show, however, is Killer Man. It is the only chapter where your character talks consistently to others, so you get unique dialogue for everyone. This leads to the funniest Easter egg in the entire game. Brainless Killer Man. See, when rescuing Randy, you don't need his brain. Now, without a brain, he gets no adrenaline, but you do get gibberish coming out of his mouth. That means you can make the farce that is Killer Man even harder to take seriously because everyone is acting like Randy is a perfectly normal human being who doesn't lack a brain. They play it completely straight, just like a B-movie. They do this for every level, but back to Killer Man, it has my second favorite bit of dialogue. When Yorg sees Killer Man decimate someone with his giant anime laser, which begs the question how does he leave his killer mark when he turns everyone to pace and then leap about 50 feet in the air he suspects jackson on the basis that he was a former gymnast thus he'd be able to leap higher than anyone else that's the killer man look at the way he jumped you know 
I remember reading that Jason used to be a professional gymnast. So it makes sense that he could pull off these killer man stunts. So does that make Jason the murderer? No, it's not right to jump to conclusions. There's not enough evidence to prove anything yet. Never mind the man turned into what would be a puddle in real life, York thinks that taking gymnastics allows you to jump good. Newsflash, I was in gymnastics and it doesn't. Nor does it give you a fuck off laser as if it did, I wouldn't be here right now. Also, Killer Man, while being a multi-million dollar suit, has a giant zipper on the back. But perhaps my favorite moment out of Ill Bleed is the little detour in the middle of Killer Man where Michael Reynolds asks, who done it? The fact that the only answer that has any modicum of sense while also being absolute buffoonery is Killer Man makes me fucking lose it. It's such an of course they're the killer choice and it doesn't help that when you get to the end of Killer Man to see the results, the game calls it the results of reasoning. Like what SGF said all those years back and what I'm saying now, reasoning had nothing to do with it. Though I could go on and on with all these moments, what acts as the glue for them is the gameplay, mainly because how it evolves with the narrative. When first starting off, you honestly feel worried and don't know what to do. Getting a hang of disarming traps with little adrenaline can make for a tense experience, especially since mistagging drains a decent amount of your brain power. Harmon of Death doesn't skimp out, and though it doesn't say Wood Puppets or Killer Department Store both having dense layouts with damaging traps, not coming to grips with the horror monitor will quickly spell your doom. One of the first sequences in Home Run is one of the many hall hallways which can be littered with traps on either side and are generally the most dangerous ones in the level being the burning doors, ghostly faces, or light bulbs. It helps get across that what will kill you faster than anything else are the levels. That doesn't mean that the enemies are a joke though. Keeping in line, Home Run has a good spread with the woefully weak Meat Man and Crash Test dummies lined up next to the admittedly dangerous Dummy Man and Bound Ballo. All have easy to understand attacks, but each attack at different intervals and consistencies. Like with the hallway for traps, they get you accustomed to combat, how important and risky dodging is, as well as showcasing that not every battle needs to be fought. Sometimes it might be a smarter idea to run away, while others getting the adrenaline boost from killing foes might be a necessary action. That's if you can't squeeze by the encounter or trap. Good map traversal is just as important as understanding what object in the environment is a trap. This is where you start to learn, as come KDS or Killer Man, you pick up on traps more often, not wasting adrenaline with useless tags. It's as if you are making a mockery of the levels, like how a viewer would watch a B-movie. You spot the flaws and realize that you shouldn't be scared of what you're dealing with, barreling through the stages while taking nary a scratch. It's as if you start off as child Eriko being afraid of everything around you before maturing into adult Eriko and laughing at the traps, unafraid of them. The worst part about Ill Bleed is how the multiple characters were implemented. On the front that they act as extra lives in case of one of their deaths, this is executed well. You're only out when the last of the group falls, and depending on the situation, switching out for a character on death, though still raw because someone has died, could make certain sections easier. Each character having a specialty is also a neat idea. It diversifies the group and makes them stand out. These aren't just cardboard cutouts, the team technically has a wide range when it comes to their abilities. However, I did say idea and technically, didn't I? Where the different characters stumble is that not only is Eriko an all-rounder making her useful in almost any level, to get the true ending you have to solo with her on New Game Plus. That means any and all upgrades put onto the other characters when going for the true ending is absolutely pointless. An upgrade not on Eriko to me is a wasted one. She should always be the one you max out first, and to cement how powerful a character she is, Eriko is the only character who doesn't get knocked down when spooked by an enemy encounter. Well, while I do like this interweaving of story and gameplay, it practically means I'll never touch any of the characters except when playing through Killer Man as being knocked down or reduced to scuttling like some undersea crustacean in the opening moments of a fight is dangerous. 
Hell, even with Eriko, she still has to pull herself up, giving an enemy enough time to damage you. Oh yeah, battling. There's no getting around it. Fights in Illbleed sometimes degrade into slap battles. It depends on the enemy, as for a surprising majority of the roster, you can stunlock them, begging me to ask why are there even enemies in the first place. It's the ones that you can't where the real frustration happens. The three worm fiasco in the near middle of Killer Department Store might be one of the most aggravating things I've had the displeasure of playing. Having to fight the worms themselves is already a hassle due to their predilection of always moving around, leaving barely any time to mount a counterattack, but what makes the encounter worse is that not only are there three to contend with, it is a mandatory fight. While the game is gracious enough to give you the hatchet for the level, getting in close to Bop the Worms has its own troubles, mainly because of how hitboxes work. The Worms have both an exact hitbox, as whenever a worm is breaching, it's considered an attack, and Nebulous One is the range of their breaches I could never figure out. Touching the worm while it's coming out of the ground will hurt you, but judging the distance the entirety of the box reaches is tricky. Why this is important is because you will have to balance out bleeding mid-fight, so while having to lower it, the worms can potentially hit you again, leading to a savage Ouroboros only matched by the likes of Devil Joe. The only other fight that ever reached this level was the tree, solely because of his awkward wind-ups. Though the dodge has generous iframes, the tree's attacks come out so weirdly timed that it made the fight a tad smidgen unfun. Another frustrating addition that the game has are the bits of randomness that crop up from time to time. There's no getting around it, have enough items to bear the brunt of taking damage when searching for Mary or Jeremy, you'll thank yourself later. To me, these are the strangest moments because the game is hyper-focused on not making you search randomly around like a coke fiend for your next hit, then throws these two moments at you. Lastly, some of the more compacted trap locations can lead to mistagging, which is a general annoyance. <laughs> If ever there was a perfect Halloween game, it would be Illbleed. Though it does have issues, combat that is generally awkward and some weak mechanics at times, Illbleed is an overall celebration of campy horror fun mixed in with some shockingly good gameplay, making it worth your while. Boot up Redream and take a tour of Michael Reynolds' virtual horror land. Illbleed. <laughs> There was a part of me hoping that on the latest Direct that this game would be a hidden curiosity brought out into the light. Though that wasn't the case, we did get Nintendo 64 and Sega Genesis games on the Switch, so hey, we could be on the right track. Granted, you have to pay extra to get those games for Switch Online, so swings and roundabouts. In before Nintendo makes you pay 60 bucks for the expansion pass like Sony and Microsoft. At least Pokemon Snap is easily accessible now, but it always annoys me when companies make their online features have a paywall. Like, Steam exists. I don't have to pay Gaben to use my internet that I'm already paying for. Makes me miss the PlayStation 3 days. What was shown on the Direct did tickle my fancy though, what with Sunbreak, Kirby, and Splatoon 3 in the gaming sense, and Bayonetta in the physical one. Ain't no lie, she gets hotter every game. They can't keep getting away with it! Too bad I suck at Bayonetta, too acid jazzy for my liking. That is a scale for another time though, whenever I cover Devil May Cry 3, God of War, or a more traditional character action game, as I don't think I brought it up in Devil May Cry 1. But we are still in Halloween mode, so I'll save that for later. This showing of Ill Bleed is over, but stay tuned for our next feature involving a cast with a wide range of abilities, survival against a deadly infection, and lukewarm reviews. <laughs>